Hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here with you today to launch our second speaker in our series, Interdisciplinary Perspectives on Learning, organized in collaboration with the Center for the Study of Learning and Performance, CSLP, Concordia, and McGill University. My name is Jehan Rabah, manager of the CSLP. I will begin by acknowledging that Concordia University is located on indigenous lands. Montreal is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. I will now give you a small introduction about the CSLP. Do you know about the CSLP? The mission of the CSLP at Concordia University is to research teaching and learning processes. We currently have about 45 faculty members and various undergraduate and graduate student members who have developed unique pedagogical expertise working with community organizations, school boards, policymaking bodies, and social health service providers. Our center's overall focus is to develop evidence-based tools and strategies that would positively impact our society. One of the center's development priorities is to support the transfer of knowledge to practice settings. For us, this speaker series is one way we are hoping to achieve this objective and reach out to several educators, public policy representatives, school counselors, researchers, and administrators of educational institutions. Welcome to all of you. Our presenter today, whom our esteemed CSLP Associate Director and member Professor Waddington will introduce in a few minutes, will have 45 minutes for her presentation. A period of questions and answers will follow. Kindly write your questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom towards the bottom of your screen. Please indicate if you would like to be called upon to ask your question directly, or otherwise we will be happy to ask it on your behalf. We will try to handle as much as possible, hopefully all of the questions. The question period will begin as soon as our speaker is done with the presentation. Finally, please note that we are recording the presentation today. The conference recording will be available on the center's website and social media pages in the coming weeks. It gives me great pleasure to give the floor now to Professor Waddington to introduce our speaker for today. Dave, off to you. Many thanks, Gian. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased to be presenting the, the second in our, our series of, of talks today. Uh, we have with us Jennifer Morton, who is going to give her talk, Moving Up Without Losing Your Way. Uh, Jennifer is an Associate Professor of Philosophy at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and a Senior Fellow at the Center for Ethics and Education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her areas of research focus on philosophy of action, moral philosophy, philosophy of education, and political philosophy. I'd like to note that in 2017, she won the inaugural Scheffler Prize for Philosophy of Education, awarded by the American Philosophical Association for a series of papers, and the prize committee remarked, Morton's work focuses especially on the demands placed on students from minority backgrounds by an educational system that is designed to assimilate them into a dominant culture and argues that such its assimilation entails political and moral costs that conflict with common assumptions of political liberalism. Morton's approach is interesting philosophically, crosses over into political theory and political science, and speaks to the problems and concerns that are recognized recognizable by everyday teachers and students. So, you know, with a recommendation like that, I'm, I'm really excited to hear what, uh, what Jennifer has to say. And uh, I, I, uh, I, I present her to you now. So uh, let's, uh, let's enjoy this, this, this upcoming talk. Take it away, Jennifer. Uh, thank you, David, for that lovely introduction. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Uh, I am uh, delighted to share my work with you today. Um, and I have a PowerPoint, so if you give me a second, I will uh, figure out how to do that, uh, which usually I'm also a little bit of, uh, there we go. Okay. Can everybody see that? Good? Yeah, great. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about the research uh, of my book, just to, uh, you know, deal with the often the monotony of Zoom, I will at some point in the middle of the talk ask for some audience participation. So just be alert 
uh, to that. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about the book. Now, um, in a way, this builds on David's introduction uh, because what really led me to the research of the book was my experience as a professor at the City College of New York. Uh, I taught at the City College of New York for 10 years before coming to UNC. Um, and it was my trying to figure out how to serve my students well, how to teach, how to be a good uh, support system for my students that um, I started uh, delving into some of the uh, philosophical issues and, and some of the social science and higher education that forms a backbone of the book. So I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about Sandra. And Sandra is how I opened the book. And she's a, in a way a composite, although Sandra is based on the real student. Her her experience and my experience with her is a composite of many conversations I had while I was at the City University of New York and that I have to, to some extent, I still have with my students here at UNC. Um, and I hope to those of you in the audience who are professors, this will be uh, uh, perhaps a familiar conversation. So Sandra started uh, as, a, as a motivated and bright student in my class. She was doing good work. She was a good writer, engaged. Uh, things were looking really well. She uh, was a Latina student, as many of my students at the City College of New York were. Um, but then uh, she started missing assignments, missing class. When she did show up to class, uh, she was often very tired and would fall asleep or, or kind of nod off. Um, and so one day she comes to my office, she makes an appointment, she had started missing class altogether, so she makes an appointment to talk about her, um, her performance in the class, um, and you know, she comes in, she's apologizing, she's late, she's upset, uh, she's trying to convince me to accept some late assignments, and we're having this conversation about how to uh, help her turn things around in the class. And as we're speaking, Sandra starts telling me that she has a lot of family drama back home. And this became a, a kind of a code word, as I saw it, that I heard from a lot of students for all sorts of situations they had to deal with while they were enrolled in college. Whether it was family members that needed financial assistance or caregiving, um, or uh, issues at home with housing insecurity and food insecurity, Often when students told me they had family drama, it, it meant a whole host of other issues that were, and often it was derailing students um, um, from doing well in their classes and, 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 and graduating. Um, so Sandra uh, and students like Sandra were what led me to the research of the book. Okay, so Many of you might be familiar uh, uh, with the traditional narrative of upward mobility that we often uphold for students. And the traditional narrative of upward mobility tells students that, you know, if they work hard and they're determined and they're focused and with a little bit of luck, uh, they can go to college, get a good job, and be able to uh, gain the benefits of upward mobility, have a good life for themselves. And the way that the narrative of upward mobility is often portrayed as one of gains. You gain and gain in the path if you're lucky to stay on it. Now, social scientists have given us lots of reasons to be skeptical uh, about uh, the possibility of upward mobility in the United States in particular. Um, so here is Raj Chetty telling us that 90% of children born in the 1940s grew up to earn more than their parents, but over the past 50 years, this measure of the American dream has been in decline. Today, only half of children grew up to earn more than their parents. And yet, it does happen, right? So some uh, people do end up getting on this path of mobility. And here I have a few examples, uh, Sonia Sotomayor, Colin Powell, Howard Schultz, of people who grew up in working class families and who followed this path, this kind of model that we have of upward mobility, worked hard, um, got ahead and, and reached the you know, great heights in their careers. 
Now, in the book, I interview strivers to figure out what we can learn about a path of mobility from the people who do succeed. So the social scientists tell us um, that not a lot of people succeed uh, and that this is this idea of upper mobility is not accessible to many. But I wanted to know more about what upward mobility was supposed to do for students from uh, thinking about those who did succeed. And what I argue in the book is that even for those who succeed, the story of upward mobility as one of uplift and, and continual gain is, uh, is mistaken and that the reality is more complicated than that. So let me tell you about one of the people I interviewed for the book. Um, so Todd is a young African-American man who grew up in a suburb of, the, of Atlanta. The neighborhood he uh, grew up in, in in Atlanta was majority minority, majority African-American, uh, low income neighborhood. Um, he lived with his grandparents and his mom and his sister at his grandparents' home. Um, and he went to the neighborhood school. The neighborhood school had a lot of the pro uh, problems uh, that uh, majority minority low income schools in the United States have. Uh, inexperienced teachers, a lot of turnover, uh, issues with the building, uh, overcrowding, and so on. Um, now, when Todd uh was a kid he was a motivated nerdy kid and and he didn't quite feel at home in his school he was bullied a lot um and then one day a teacher got stabbed at his school and his mom thought i've had enough and um sent todd uh to a suburban magnet school by lying about her address so she asked a friend of hers um, to allow them to use her address. This friend lived in a, in a nicer suburban neighborhood um, and Todd was able to go to this magnet school. Now, um, Todd's uh, life changed a lot once he started going to the suburban magnet school. At this school, most kids were bound for college. That was the assumption they were going to college. Um, his friend's parents were doctors and dentists and lawyers. Um, and, and he was able to uh, excel academically at the school. Um, from listening to his friends and figuring out how to apply to college, Todd became the first person in his family uh, to go to college um, where he did very well. Um, and he earned an internship with the federal government um, after graduation. And when I met Todd, he was finishing up his master's degree at an Ivy League university. So Todd's trajectory was one that should be familiar from these stories of upper mobility. He grew up in a kind of poor working class neighborhood and he um, got a, a master's degree from Ivy League University. And last I heard he was uh, working as a diplomat um, for the United States government. And so his life had this kind of trajectory that we see. But what I argue in the book is that it, things are a lot more complicated than that, um, that in order to gain educational and career opportunities that will propel them into the middle class, strivers, the uh, group of students I focus on, um, often must make sacrifices in many areas of their lives they find valuable, relationships with family and friends, connection to their community, and sense of identity. And this is what I call the ethical cost of upward mobility. And to really understand what this looks like, let's go back to Todd's story. So once we dig beneath the surface of Todd's story, we can see that things are not as simple and kind of uh, bright and, and uh, as we might initially have thought. Um, so Todd's neighborhood school was actually one that his mom had attended, his grandparents had attended, um, his extended family who lived in the same neighborhood attended and his sister was attending. So it's a school that was very deeply tied to his community and to his neighborhood. Um, when uh, Todd started attending the suburban magnet school, he was embarrassed about uh, where he was growing up. Um, and, and he um, 
um, would often have to lie or, or avoid talking about his home life with his friends at the suburban magnet school. So as Todd's going into the suburban magnet school, he's basically starting to uh, uh, have this kind of division between his home life and his school life. When he gets to college, Todd uh, doesn't find that there uh, that academically he has any problems. He does very well. His suburban magnet school prepared him well for college, but he does find it hard to make friends um, and 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 find a community in college. Part of this is because Todd is working really hard and uh, to pay his way through college, he gets some aid, but he still has to work many hours and a lot of the things that uh, people around him were doing to socialize took time and were expensive and so Todd um, didn't participate in as many of those activities but he told me that it was also a kind of a culture shock that he um, felt not completely at ease with a lot of the uh, his peers in college and this sense of uh, unease continued when he was in his internship uh, in the foreign service where when Todd would tell um, the other people at work that he was from Atlanta, they would say things like, oh, great, you know, I've been to Atlanta, I love this restaurant, this bar, I've been to this place. But the Atlanta that Todd knew was very different than the Atlanta that his upper middle class um, uh, co-workers knew. And so it would lead to these awkward situations where he wouldn't really know all of the things that they were talking about because they had they knew an Atlanta that was very different than the one that uh, he knew. Um, so uh, uh, Todd found it uh, kind of hard to make friends at his internship and college. And at the same time, he's growing ever more distant from his family. Now, at first, this is because uh, um, he uh, uh, is far away and once he's uh, living in DC, it's harder to visit his family and so on. And, and at some point his grandparents die and that also plays a factor. But part of it as well is that uh, Todd started um, having a lot of arguments with his sister over money. So as soon as he started working, Todd um, was, uh, um, sorry, there's like a distracting thing on my screen here. Okay, so as soon as he started working, Todd was sending money back to his sister, but his sister had a lot of financial trouble and she thought it was never enough. And so whenever he would call home, they would get into these arguments and Todd um, and his sister would uh, argue about money. And so Todd started calling his family less and less because he didn't want to have these arguments. And when we talked about it, he felt very um, kind of guilty and, and, and to some extent regretted the distance that had grown between him and his sister. And because he wasn't visiting home as much, his extended family and the people in his neighborhood. So what we see with Todd is that as he's trying to um, make his way in this path of upper mobility, he's finding it hard to connect to others in these new communities he's trying to enter. And at the same time, he's experiencing this distancing uh, with uh, the relationships uh, to those that he had grown up with. All right. Now, what I argue in the book uh, is that um, the, the potential loss for strivers um, takes place in terms of ethical goods. So the way I think about it in the book is that ethical goods are those aspects of our lives that we value and give it meaning. What we might think of as contributing to our flourishing. For strivers, the ethical goods at stake are often relationships with family and friends, their connection to their community and their sense of identity. And we see this very clearly in Todd's story where uh, his relationships with the family and friends that he grew up were um, off, were were eroded through uh, his rise um, in in the path of upward mobility and his connection to his, to his community and as Todd told me his sense of himself as uh, someone who came from a certain kind of neighborhood he also felt kind of conflicted about it um, in in light of his path. Okay. Um, 
What I argue in the book is that strivers risk undermining or losing some of these ethical goods for the sake of educational and career opportunities. But there is this question about how this happens. I don't think anybody, uh, or none of the people I talked to, uh, Todd didn't just sort of sit down and say, you know, I'm gonna have to distance myself from my family in order to achieve these opportunities. That's not actually how it happened. So let me tell you a little bit about how I saw this happening at CUNY when I was teaching there. So um, most of our students at CUNY um, are uh, strivers. So 42% uh, are the first in their family to go to college. About 40% come from families that make less than $20,000 a year in New York City. Uh, many qualify for Pell Grants, which is another measure of, uh, um, of poverty uh, in higher education. And 78% are students of color. And what I saw with my students at CUNY wasn't that uh, students would really make a conscious decision. I'm gonna you know, prioritize my own educational trajectory over being there for my family, but rather that in the day-to-day -day life, students often face this conflict between uh, playing these support roles for their family or, or responding to needs or demands from uh, family or friends or the community and investing in their education. So I would have students who would miss class sometimes because they would uh, have to do childcare for a cousin who had had childcare fall through or go with her grandmother um, to, uh, to court to translate for her because she didn't speak English. Or uh, I had a couple of students who had to take on full-time jobs to support their families because a parent lost um, their job or had become disabled. And so what I saw with my students was that they often face these conflicts between attending class, studying, doing the work necessary to get their degree and the demands that they face at home or from their communities. And they were often kind of torn and ambivalent about what to do. Okay, so the ethical costs at stake, I think, cannot be accounted for in the same way that financial time and other kinds of investment can. So there is a tendency, I think, to, to sort of try to think about these ethical costs as uh, short-term sacrifices that will be made up by the long-term gains that college education offers. However, I don't think that that's going to work. So let me tell you a little bit about why. Now in here, I draw on some of the philosophical literature on love and caring. And what this philosophical literature points out is that those to whom we have these deep relationships, like our family, our friends, perhaps our relationships to our communities, um, are uh, characterized by the fact that the person to whom we are related in this way is not replaceable. So um, for example, uh, I have a wonderful daughter who's uh, almost four and she's funny and she's, you know, delightful. Now suppose that uh, in the evening, you know, somehow she got swapped by another kid who was equally funny and delightful, right? And, and in the morning somebody was like, well, now this is your kid and she'll, you know, She'll play the same role in your life that your, that your kid played, uh, and she has all of the same qualities. Uh, now, this is a fanciful philosopher's example, but what it points out is that when uh, we're thinking about these relationships that really matter to us, what matters is being in a relationship with that particular person, not just that person's qualities, uh, not just the role they play in our life. And what this means is that even as strivers are having their relationships um, affected by their being on the path of upward mobility, it does not mean that uh, when they gain new friendships, new relationships, they have their own families, we can think of those as replacing or making whole the loss that they experience. So even as Todd, you know, he got married to someone else with a college degree, and I, I haven't talked to him in a little bit, but um, he might have had kids at some point, even as he has his own family, it doesn't mean that that just sort of makes up for the fact that there were things that he lost on the way. Okay, so this is the part where I'm going to ask you to participate. Uh, if I can somehow get the chat to show up, which I've been having a little bit of trouble doing. Um, 
And uh, the question that I want you to think about is, I've told you a little bit about the kind of sacrifices that strivers make on the path of upward mobility in order to achieve uh, and, and access these educational and career opportunities. But now you might be thinking, don't we all make sacrifices for the sake of these educational and career opportunities? Even the student who's well off uh, often has to sacrifice uh, time um, that they could spend doing something else. Um, they have to uh, make these trade-offs between different parts of their lives. Like maybe they have a hobby or other sorts of things that they're interested in um, that they're putting on hold in order to pursue a college education or that they're not able to fully uh, participate because they're pursuing a college education. So why is it that the ethical trade-offs that these strivers are making is different. Why are those trade-offs different than the ones that the more well-off students are making? And another way of putting the question is, as I have it on the slide, don't all college students make these kind of trade-offs? So I was hoping that you could, in the chat, um, I'll give you a minute to think about this question and write what you think might be the difference uh, if you think there's a difference between the trade-offs that strivers make and the trade-offs uh, that others make. Um, so I'm going to give you a minute there and I'm going to try to figure out how to show this on my deck. Let's see the chat. Oh, okay. Oh, I can see. Oh, here it is. Okay. Uh, okay, so feel free to write into the chat uh, what you think the difference here might be between the sacrifices the strivers have to make and those that, you know, all co college students who are better off uh, have to make. Okay, and I'll give you a minute to think about it, and then I'm going to tell you what my answer is. Oh, and I see Sarah's here. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> um, uh, Okay, great. These are excellent answers. Uh, so the future conformity to cultural norms, uh, sharper brave with their home communities and those who are better off. These are all great answers. Uh, stronger safety nets. Uh, the degree of trade off might be different. Great. So these are all uh, really uh, interesting answers. And um, I will tell you a little bit about what I say in the book, although I'm not entirely satisfied with what I'd say in the book as a full answer. And that's why I'm curious to read uh, what some of you have said. So the, the answer that I give in the book um, is that the ethical costs um, are borne disproportionately by students from disadvantaged communities because of unjust economic, social, and cultural factors that are beyond their control. And so the idea is that strivers are uh, uh, facing these ethical costs that are unjust because they're connected to other structures of injustice. And I'm gonna make the argument for that, though I, as again, I think it's not a complete answer here. Um, and we're happy to talk more about this in Q&A. So, okay. So I have three examples that I'm gonna use to try to make the argument and I'm gonna connect them back up to Todd. And I think that will help you see uh, some of what I'm talking about here. So the first is that in the United States, there's a very tight link between school segregation and long racial and economic lines and educational opportunity. I'm not going to read this quote. This is from the UCLA Civil Rights Project, but, but you can see there that the, the kind of the essence of the quote is that what we saw in taught school, that a low-income school that serves predominantly minority students 
will have less qualified teachers, lower graduation rates, and many other limitations uh, that make it um, harder for students in those schools to be in a good position to attend college, to apply to college, um, and to kind of be in this path of upward mobility. So what does this mean? I think that what it means is that for someone like Todd and like Todd's family, that distancing that he felt, that initial distance that he took from his family when he went off to um, the suburban magnet school was necessary for him to be in this path of educational opportunity, right? So his, for his mom to send him to school that put uh, him in a good position to apply to college, he had to send him far from home. Um, there was no school in her neighborhood that where Todd could go to school with uh, teachers she knew, with parents she knew, within their community, with an extended family, and that also uh, had the resources and support that would put Todd on the path to college. Um, the, the neighborhood school uh, um, wasn't really uh, as good of an option as a suburban magnet school. If Todd had grown up in a family that was better off, now that family might choose if they wanted to, to send their kid off to go to, I don't know, a private school halfway across the country. But there was an option for that family of a school that could put their kid in the path to college and in which uh, that school was integrated into her community and in which neighbors sent their kids and in which they knew the other families and so on. But that wasn't a ch choice for Todd's family. So I think school segregation really plays a critical role here. Um, the second point I wanna make is about the inadequate safety net. Um, and so here I'm looking at the work of Sarah Goldberg Robb um, in, in her book, Paying the Price. And one of the uh, uh, things that she looks at is how students uh, are navigating a financial aid system that is often only leaving them with food insecurity, housing insecurity, and so on. And there's a story she tells of Nima, who went to college to escape the sort of work that her uh, working class family had been doing. Um, but her father was disabled and Nima wanted to earn a college degree in order to help her family have a better life. But the family could not survive losing Nima's wages as she pursued school. And so she worked and felt pressure to work in positions that left her too tired for school. She was facing impossible choices. And so what we see here is this kind of second factor I want to highlight, which is that when the safety net is inadequate, when there are gaps in terms of uh, disability insurance, in terms of childcare, in terms of elder care, um, this can often end up falling on college age students who are seen by families and who themselves feel like they can help their families in this way by either going to work or taking care of children or uh, uh, helping with an elderly relative and so on. And so when the safety net is inadequate, that can also lead to these trade-offs for students where they feel torn about whether to pursue their own educational or career ambitions and uh, supporting their families who need it and who can't turn to the safety net um, to fill some of those needs. Okay, the, the final one here is about this cultural aspect and this came across in the Q&A uh, to some extent, but um, First-generation college students often have an interdependent cultural model, according to Nicole Stevens, a uh, uh, psychologist at Northwestern, and she argues that selective college campuses are often dominated by an independent cultural model, and that there is a mismatch here that affects first-generation college students' ability to navigate and succeed in college. And so, uh, Stevens argues using evidence of intervention she's done as well that first generation college students are are finding it hard to navigate college in part because of a cultural mismatch between the assumptions they're bringing to college and the assumptions that the college operates under. Um, and and how she kind of distinguishes the two these two cultural models 
is by asking faculty and students administrators what they think are reasons to go to college, what are some reasons of students citing going to college. And um, you can see on the screen that interdependent items help my family out after I'm done with college, be a role model for people in my community. This is uh, more first generation students will offer these as reasons to go to college, whereas more faculty and staff um, and students whose parents have gone to college will offer the following independent uh, items, expand my knowledge of the world, become an independent thinker, explore new interests. And so uh, what Stevens argue is, is that this mismatch leads to, to uh, some of the uh, uh, gaps in GPA that we see between first generation college students and continuing generation students. Happy to talk more about that in Q&A. Um, Anthony Jack, uh, who spoke the privileged poor, also looks at this cultural element. Um, he, what he does is he looks at uh, Black and Latino low income students in a selective college campus, um, but he divides them into two groups. Um, students who have, through scholarship programs, been able to attend a highly selective private high school, um, the kind of high school that prepares students to go to these selective college campuses, and students who come from similar family backgrounds, socioeconomic backgrounds are also Black or Latinx, but who um, just attend their local neighborhood school. And what he finds is that the privileged poor, as he calls the students who attend these kind of elite uh, preparatory high schools, despite having similar socioeconomic backgrounds to the doubly disadvantaged, find college a much easier place to navigate. They have been acculturated in the culture that dominates uh, elite college campuses. Okay, so um, let me just say, so this also gives us some insight, I think, into some of what we saw with Todd's story. So we saw with Todd that he was having a hard time making friends in these new spaces that he was entering. And part of it was, he said, like a, a cultural divide that he felt, um, that the, the, the culture that dominated these spaces that he was entering wasn't one that he felt totally comfortable with. And this led to him not only feeling uh, kind of distance, but finding it hard to access other ethical goods one might access in a college campuses, new friendships, new communities, and so on. And happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. Okay, now I, I would be remiss if I didn't say something about the pandemic here, because I think what the pandemic has done is has shown us how uh, this failure of the safety net really ends up affecting college students. So the failures of the safety net, as I said, often fall disproportionately on college age adults who are, in many cases, best able to provide care and financial support to their families, friends, and community. But doing so leaves them with little time or resources to pursue their own educational and career pursuits. And the pandemic has revealed that magnified this critical role this driver's play. So I, um, and I'm curious to hear from the audience in the Q&A, I have seen this with my own students who are um, filling in the gaps for family by taking jobs when the parent loses a job, by doing childcare when schools are closed and, and are really um, finding it hard to do all of those things for their families while attending college um, at the same time. Okay. So uh, uh, let me just, because I want to have enough time for q and so I'm just going to go through this a uh, little quickly. So what I argue in the book is that we need to give strivers a more, more cleared-eyed ethical narratives that acknowledge the ethical costs, situate them in a broader context, and help students to think clearly about the trade-offs that they're making in this path of upward mobility. And I was inspired by thinking about the importance of narratives based on my own experience. So I'm a first generation college student. I'm also an immigrant. Um, and when I got to college, I experienced many of the challenges that first generation college students experience, but I also um, had this immigrant narrative. So I immigrated to the United States to go to university. 
And I had a way of telling myself a story in which the disconnect I felt sometimes with the campus culture, in which my maybe lack of understanding of exactly what was going on, uh, the distance I felt from my family, I could sort of accommodate all of this into thinking of it as part of the immigrant experience and not as reflective of something you know, about myself necessarily, but about my situation. And I think this can be having a model that helps us understand how our experiences can be just a reflection of the situation that we're in and not necessarily uh, you know, a reflection of who we are as people can be helpful to strivers. And I've seen this with uh, some of the strivers I talked to who you know, thought that some of the trade-offs they had made reflected badly on them as people. Um, rather than sort of acknowledging that it was a feature of the difficult situation that they were in. And so I think that there's some elements of the ethical narrative that we need to uh, uh, kind of think about and thinking about how to kind of help students have, build their own narrative of how higher uh, upward mobility. The first is recognizing the value of the goods that are left behind as ethical. And I think often we don't give students the space to kind of mourn the loss and recognize that what they're giving up is an important good um, in, in a life and that that the, that sacrifice or um, is meaningful and important because what is being left behind is uh, uh, an important good. I think acknowledging that trade-offs are central to the experience of upward mobility, right? That uh, um, there are sacrifices that we have to make and that they're painful um, is an important part. But then developing a deeper understanding of the historical and structural factors that impact one's path, seeing um, our choices as embedded in these larger structural and historical factors, um, I think is also critical. And finally, appreciating one's own agency and resisting or contributing to the factors that lead to ethical costs for strivers. And, and I'd be happy to talk more about that in Q&A. Um, let's see, this is not so uh, Okay, so I think in closing, I, just to return to the pandemic, because I think it's important, um, I think the pandemic has further revealed the inadequacies of our narratives around higher education and upper mobility. And I think it has shown all of us, right, not just drivers, the importance of ethical goods, family, friendship, community to leading flourishing lives. And I think we've all seen uh, how the failures in the safety net undermine our capacity to enjoy those ethical goods and to flourish. So I think this is an opportunity for all of us to rethink the narratives that we have around higher education to be more ethical, to be more responsive to all of the goods that we want um, strivers and ourselves to enjoy. And I think that the very kind of uh, difficult situation that we put strivers in in the United States is that we pit their own flourishing at the expense of their families or their communities flourishing. And then strivers often feel torn about what to do. And so I hope that we, this gives us an opportunity to rethink upward mobility um, as well. Okay, and so I'll just say thank you and looking forward to uh, Q&A. Um, okay. Hey. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I invite everyone to start uh, noting their questions in the Q&A button. So guys, uh, hopefully, hopefully people will start to, to type their questions in on, on, on the Q&A, but thank you very much, Jennifer, for a, a wonderful uh, presentation there. Very, very interesting. I mean, maybe I'll just uh, break the ice here by asking a first question. And that is, I mean, this is an obvious one. I'm sure one you've responded to a million times already, but is there not a risk if we're not, if we're kind of too honest about the costs and take too clear-eyed an approach that it can kind of 
end up end up trapping end up trapping people where where they are. I mean, I'm I'm from the rural maritime provinces in Canada. Upward mobility is a kind of central theme, and how people think about their mm-hmm. lives in e- economically disadvantaged parts of Canada, like where I'm from. And uh, yeah, I mean, it would seem to me that there there are advantages to a clear-eyed approach, but also could it induce some paralysis to some extent? Thank you for that, David. I think that's right. I think that it's a it's risky, right? Because, and I think that many of us who are in education have felt the risk uh, at some point in interacting with students, which is that if we tell students uh, what to expect, I think we're afraid that students will then think, well, I don't, I don't want to make those sacrifices, right? Or like, that's not for me, or I don't want to participate in this structure of upward mobility that, uh, you know, damages potentially like communities and families. Um, And I think that's right. Like that is a risk, I guess, you know, as a philosopher, I'm I'm like, I'm interested in truth. And I think we should be honest with our students. But I also just to kind of like, make it less, uh, perhaps controversial, I think that students do know this and opt out. Like I think students are already opting out in part because they're responding to valuable features in their lives that they don't want to give up on. And uh, you see that it's very much in rural cases, you know, in like North Carolina now, I have many first generation students who are from rural parts of the state. And it's sort of acknowledged in their families and in their communities that if they do go off to college and succeed, they won't come back. Right. And that's a loss. And some of their peers don't want to take that route. Um, And so I think that that's um, that is a risk. But I think that we're going to respect people's um, capacity to sort of uh, make choices about their own flourishing and and, you know, think about what goods to invest in and what they would rather prioritize. I think we have to be honest with students. And I think also having this this kind of overly rosy picture of upward mobility um, cur- um, kind of leads us to not really think hard about what alternative models might be of redistributing educational opportunity. Well, th- thanks very much for that uh, answer, Jennifer. I mean, I see that people are starting to pose questions using the Q&A feature of Zoom, very encouraged, and also are posing questions in the chat. So um, uh, uh, there'll be a bit more, uh, a few good questions on the table already, I see. Yeah, so I said, uh, let's see, Kathleen says, can you say more about ethical narratives? Are they institutionally constructed? How can these be made authentic and not in the interest of the institution that recruits students at all costs? Um, yeah, and so you, uh, Kathleen is worried about how we apply these in real contexts. Um, this is a question I have as well. One, one way I've been thinking about it is um, in the ways in which we allow spaces in higher education for this to happen. Um, in the classroom, for example. So I teach a class uh, for first year students called uh, Aspiration and Transformation. And and part of what I do in that class is I have some philosophical texts, but I also have some memoirs. Um, You know, we are reading this semester, we're reading Educated, uh, Richard Rodriguez's Hanger of Memory, the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I like change it a little bit each time I teach it. But what I think this does is give students uh, the opportunity to reflect on, on what they want out of a college experience and to sort of think about what their own story might be or could be. Um, as they're getting to campus and, and sort of excited and thinking about uh, what they want out of college. And so um, giving students a space to sort of think about their own narratives, uh, think about what they're hoping to get out of college. I mean. I used to teach philosophy of education when I taught at the City College of New York, and um, it was an upper level philosophy course, so I often get juniors and seniors, and so many of my students had never asked themselves the question or been asked to reflect on it in a, in a kind of structured space, why they were in college, what were they supposed to be getting out of it, what they wanted to get out of it, and so that's, even at that step, I think it's, it's, giving students a space. 
But I do worry, Kathleen, that um, the way this might get implemented uh, might be to uh, kind of push students in one direction that kind of fits the institutional priorities. Of, and I think that is a real worry. Um, so uh, let me take one from the Q&A. Are there ways that higher education can do better with supporting students who are aiming to increase their socioeconomic standing um, and who are also closely tied to their family and personal responsibilities? Um, yeah, I, I think that there, there are um, different sort of models for, for thinking about this, depending on what level of, of uh, idealization you want to go for. So. I think the safety net and the lacks in the safety net are obviously a way, addressing those are a way of helping students uh, be able to access the goods that higher education has to offer while hopefully not um, having as much tension with, with their family and their communities because they don't feel uh, that their families and communities are in this dire need if we have those social services available. Uh, but that might be too pie in the sky, then you have to think, what can we do within educational institutions, right? And I think one of the um, really great things about the Sarah Goldrick Roth book, which looks at the financial aspects of students' education, is that it also shows us the ways in which, in the United States at least, how we've conceived of financial aid really uh, doesn't acknowledge the important support roles that students play in their families. We don't really acknowledge the lost income of the student going to college and how that will affect that family's ability to provide um, care for family members um, and so on. And so I think there are things we can think about in the financial aid uh, structuring sector. And then I think in our classrooms, right, as faculty, uh, just be more mindful about what students are bringing into the classroom and how we can uh, be supportive of students who are making these sacrifices. Um, so I argue in another uh, paper that if students are making such big sacrifices in areas of their lives um, that have to do with personal relationships, with being part of a community, with friends, then I think colleges have an obligation to think about how welcoming the student uh, um, the college culture is to that student making new friends, developing new relationships. And what we find in the research is that actually uh, college campuses can be very hard places for students from first generation and low income backgrounds to find uh, community and friendship and connection. And so I think we need to think more on college campuses about how we make it easier for students um, to find those. Uh, and Beatrice asks about the importance of family validation. Uh, this is a great question and I don't really know the answer to it. I, by the end of the book, I was kind of left with this question about, you know, what, do, what are these families thinking and how are families left to contend with these losses that are also losses for them, right? So if a relationship like Todd's relationship with his sister is damaged, Todd's sister also loses something valuable. Um, and so I have this question and I'd love to see research on this about how families and communities process um, this uh, kind of distancing and, and how they think about it. Um, and then there's a thank you from Asuria about uh, her role as an indigenous student advisor to other indigenous students in Concordia, and I uh, very much appreciate uh, the comment. Uh, all right, uh, were you able to share your findings with any of your interviewees? Um, yeah, so I, um, with the people I interviewed, I sent them the relevant part of the, not, so not everyone I interviewed appeared in the book, but the ones that appeared in the book, I sent them the part where they appeared to make sure that it was, you know, that they were happy with the portrayal, although I give them pseudonyms. Um, and uh, many of them were, were uh, you know, 
I think glad to have the, their stories out there, but I think glad to hopefully have a book out there that if the, when they had been in college, right, if somebody like them was in college could turn to and sort of have a way of articulating their experience. And that was my goal in writing the book. And so I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that. And I'm thrilled to get emails from people who tell them, who tell me that it was helpful for them to have a framework for an experience that I might, I had this experience as well that um, can feel very lonely and very confusing. I think one of the things that philosophy can do is, is help us articulate those experiences um, and, and sort of organize them into uh, a structure that, that helps us understand uh, what we went through. Uh, so a question from Ayan about resiliency. Um, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm not sure that I would put the, the difference between people who are, strive and are quote unquote successful and those who, who get off the path as one of resilience. Um, it seems to me and part of the hope with writing the book was also to make it uh, intelligible why people opt out, right? To make it uh, seem like a reasonable choice, a reasonable ethical choice. So I think when you're faced with different, different ethical goods that are being traded off against each other, um, and they're both very important, uh, we have to acknowledge that reasonable people could go either way, right? That some people make the choice to pursue higher education, um, and some people decide to opt out. And I think that is a legitimate, in many cases, choice that is responsive to values that that person is engaged with. Um, and so uh, I, I think that's, that's kind of an important component of what I'm trying to do here. Uh, how are the, eth the ethical costs different from social capital? Good. So I think many of the ways that we have of, of talking about social capital and the kind of Bordeaux inspired uh, literature in the social sciences is as uh, conventions that different cultures have around particular, you know, whether it's taste or, or ways of interacting or ways of talking. Uh, but what I'm interested in here is not um, kind of culture per se, but those meaningful aspects of our lives, our relationships with each other um, and how those relationships are at stake um, and through the path of upward mobility. And so the ethical costs really are those goods in our lives that are friendship, family, uh, relationships to our communities, uh, they might be educational goods, um, and as I see them, those are goods that are critical to flourishing. Now, cultural, you know, social capital, uh, that's a way of thinking about the relationships that we have as a, as a kind of uh, factor that we might use to our advantage or not, or that might give us access to certain resources. But I think the ethical dimension is thinking about those as the meaningful, valuable aspects of our lives that are the reason often that we do what we do, right? It's not uh, just a resource, it's kind of constitutes a good life. Um, and so th that's the way that I favor thinking about it. So we have here, um, uh, whether it's possible that many or most strivers are strivers in part because they're already somewhat more detached from their home, local cultural norms and relationships. Uh, might this affect how we think about the costs? Oh yeah, so this is a, 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 a really uh, good question. And actually um, something that I found in the interviews that I did was that some strivers um, had been encouraged by uh, their families to not develop very close, tight relationships to say neighbors um, or people in their communities. Um, and I think um, part of, and there's some social science research on this, but part of it seems to be parents fear that if, um, a, you know, a child of theirs is too, too tightly bound up in their community, they're going to find it harder to 
leave in order to access these educational opportunities. I think that does change from the individual's perspective, the calculus, right? They, they have less to lose perhaps. But I think from uh, thinking about what we want education to do and, and, and a broader perspective, I think we should be, uh, that should be another reason that we're skeptical of this narrative of upward mobility. If, if what it actually encourages is for uh, parents to have their child not be connected and enmeshed in their community and feel those close bonds because um, and parents are afraid that this will prevent their child from uh, accessing uh, educational or career opportunities or opportunity for upper mobility. I think that's that's a problem with the with a system as a whole, even if from the individual's perspective, it might seem um, like it makes it easier. Um, so Diane says she's an academic from a working class family and have experienced many of the complex you described. I appreciate your talk. Thank you, Dan. I think academics having had these experiences have an important role to play in the university. Yeah, and I agree. I think there is a more visibility lately, and I think it's increasingly important to have it um, highlighted that there are academics who come from first generation backgrounds or working class backgrounds, because I think it gives our students um, uh, models to to think about what's what's possible for them and so I I tell my students I'm the first person in my family to go to college and that they can ask me anything at all about college and the social and cultural dynamics and, and so on and and I find that students do uh, do that um, because because they see me as someone who's potentially um, been not not kind of doesn't come to academia with the assumptions that maybe some other people do. Um, is going to college and developing oneself through that experience of kind of self-actualization and transformation that is acquired through higher ed and ethical good? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So I think that college has the potential to offer us ethical goods um, in many forms, whether it's knowledge that is a good in of itself or or um, you know, developing and discovering an interest, or friends and community, um, but those can be more or less accessible uh, depending on um, how the how the institution um, is set up. So some institutions uh, of higher education are set up in ways that make it harder for students to access some of those ethical goods. So I think it, it depends, but I do think there are a lot of potential ethical goods that higher education has to offer. Um, I can go to the chat here. Uh, okay, I think I've answered that. Uh, you find a correlation between subject areas and the ethical costs of pursuing higher education. Is it less damaging to study pre-med versus English literature? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I don't, um, I haven't thought about that correlation. I do think it can be, um, the one aspect of higher education the strivers have to deal with is explaining what it is that they're, doing to their parents when their parents haven't had the experience of going to college um, in many cases. And so making it intelligible, their choices to their parents, that can be a source of um, conflict. And it was for me when I decided to pursue philosophy. My mom was very skeptical about uh, what I was doing. Um, and, and that is, um, I think, another aspect of this kind of distancing. Uh, so, okay, the only people who look like me. Yeah, and so I think going back to uh, an earlier question about resilience and how to think about uh, what helps students um, persevere and continue in higher education, I think a lot of it is, um, of course, these outside factors, but also some of it is seeing models of people like you in uh, succeeding in this path. Right, and, and uh, I think that is also critical and often we expect students to do this thing uh, that 
we don't necessarily give them good models about how to do it or that other people like them have done it. And so I think that's also critical. And I think who you see on campus, who you see in front of you in the classroom versus who you see, um, you know, who the custodial staff is can feel like a kind like evidence, I think that that um, you don't belong in, in one domain as opposed to the other. And so um, college campuses can be more sensitive, I think, to, to those sorts of uh, sources of evidence that they give students. Uh, great. Well, guys, I, I, I see we have a few minutes left. Okay, we have till till 1.45, so we have time for um, uh, a couple other questions. If, um, if, if, if anyone wants to, to pose them in, in the Q&A, perhaps. But if not, okay, you know, my, my question can give you a little bit more time. Uh, if, 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 if not, uh, I, I was wondering, Jennifer, are there any, say, literary or, uh, any useful tools for, for, for kind of broaching these questions in, in the classroom? I'm thinking of literature or film that you found particularly useful for kind of stimulating discussion of these, um, of, of these costs uh, that, that, that some students have to bear. Yeah, so I think uh, I, I mentioned this a little bit, but Tara Westover's Educated, I think that novel is, is um, I mean, it's, those of you who don't know it, she's, grown up in Idaho in a kind of survivalist Mormon family. So she, her parents don't uh, go, allow the children to go to public school. They don't go to the doctor. They don't kind of participate in, in public life. Um, but she, uh, Westover finds her way to Bingham Young and then, you know, has this kind of uh, narrative of upward mobility, but she's fairly conflicted about what she gives up in the process. And a lot of the book is her processing these losses and these tensions with her family. Um, so I think that's a good resource. I think Richard Rodriguez's Hunger of Memory, a controversial book when it came out because Richard Rodriguez is famously against affirmative action. And, and a lot of what he says in that book is, is um, comes from the perspective, I think someone who, who very much resented being seen as uh, as a paradigm of, of like achievement for a working class uh, Latino guy um, and, and his rejection of, of that role that he saw people as putting him in. But I think it has a lot of similar themes in, in the ways in which uh, he navigated uh, the, the perils, I think, of going through um, this educational trajectory. And in his case, it is, he also is fairly ambivalent um, about what his path was. And so I think that's a good book to read. And in particular, because students, I think, uh, are, are willing to be critical of some of the claims that Rodriguez makes, but it's uh, provocative in that way. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so I also, um, uh, rely on some, uh, thinking about some, like Du Bois, um, of course, uh, of our cultural strivings and, and um, thinking about the African-American experience. And this semester, we're reading the autobiography of Malcolm X, um, which can also be a way to foster this kind of reflection uh, with students. Um, but I think it's really important in, in a student, especially in their first year of college, to give students the space to engage in this kind of reflection about what they value and what they're hoping to get out of college. Because uh, a kind of another theme that runs through my work is that if we're not reflective and kind of mindful, uh, the social structures that we're in will sort of push us in certain directions. And, um, and I think for, for students when they arrive to college, they're trying to make friends, they're trying to do well. Um, and it can be easy for them to get caught up on the in the social hierarchies and structures that they see on campus um, and, and, and might not be sufficiently reflective if they're not given the space to, to be reflective in this way. 
Oh yeah, Hellbilly Elegy is also an interesting one. Uh, although a controversial book uh, as well, but, but you know, I think uh, could probably uh, lead to, to interesting discussion. Well, guys, I see that we've uh, pretty much come to the end of our time and uh, seeing no, uh, no further questions in the, in the queue for the moment. Uh, I'd just like to uh, remind everyone that um, Ashley Taylor on, on March 17th is going to be our, our, next, uh, our next event in, uh, in our speaker series. Ashley's a, a, a wonderful speaker and I, I highly encourage you to sign up for her talk, which is going to be on disability. So, um, but with that plug uh, accomplished, and of course we have many other talks in the series that are, are, are just as, as wonderful as well. Thank you so much for being Thank with us all. today. Jim. Thank you for being here. And um, I hope you, you defrost soon. <laughs> Thank you so much for an enlightening and engaging presentation. I would, I would also like to thank all the CSLP uh, team members behind the scenes that made this happen today. Thank you so much. And on behalf of everyone, I wish you all a great rest of the day. Thank you. Bye.